Y'all had a good week? Amen. I want to take your Bibles today and turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Now, I'm going to kindly apologize up front. I've been fighting a little uh, upper respiratory stuff. So if I have to sip on some water, y'all going to love me anyway, aren't you? All right. And, um, but, um, so I apologize for my voice up front. But I want us to turn to Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 1. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, my uh, life verse is found in Philippians 3, verse 10. If you've ever received anything from me as far as a letter or anything else, um, you'll notice I always put Philippians 3.10 um, with my signature, with my name. Um, and we're not going to deal with verse 10. We're going to deal with it next week by itself. Um, but what we want to do is look at verses 1 through 9 uh, this morning. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 9. So if you would please stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but to you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Amazing. Father, I just loved you and praised you today. Father, I just come to you now just absolutely confessing my utter dependence upon you to do in and through me during this time that only you can do. Father, there's nothing that I can say that has eternal value, but everything you say has eternal value. So, Father, would you speak? Lord, would you set me aside and would you speak to our hearts? And, Lord, as we glean from this passage, Father, of Paul's personal declaration and testimony that he's about to give to this church of Philippi, Father, may we learn from it. May we glean from it. And, Father, maybe... In this place today, Father, that there are those that, Lord, maybe find themselves the way Paul used to be, and Father, need to see themselves the way Paul sees himself now. Father, you be glorified in what you do and how you do it, and Lord, we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Now, when you come across this term in verse 1, finally, my brethren, Obviously, he's writing to the church of Philippi, and it's not like he's saying, I'm done speaking. He's just saying, now let me continue on with what I've been doing or saying. Now, we've already seen in chapter 1 the great truths of, of, of Paul's desire and, and Paul's admonishment of his oneness in Christ. Chapter 2, we saw the great passages on unity of the body as, as Philip, the church of Philippi were struggling a little bit with unity they had some division among them and Paul was encouraging them of what true biblical unity looked like to have the mind of Christ in which they had and to walk in the reality of that mind in that Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross and then here in chapter 3 he's going to get very personal this is one of those occasions <coughs> in which Paul just literally lets down the guard a little bit and gets very personal with those he's writing to. And of course, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he does this. But what he does in verses 1 through 3, he begins with a per personal declaration um, in which he makes to this church. So let's look at this personal declaration of Paul. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He, he's speaking here of a, the devotion of the Christian life. It, what is he saying? The rejoice in the Lord. The, word, the key word in that phrase you would think is rejoice. And it, even though it is an emphatic word, the, really the key word is a little two-letter word, in. 
because that's the word that gives this little phrase all the e emphasis. What it means is he's saying rejoice in, in the sphere of, in the environment of, in the atmosphere of the Lord. In other words, what is the devotion of the Christian life? What is the one thing that Paul is admonishing these of Philippi to do? Yes, to rejoice, but you listen, you and I can never ever rejoice until we get to the place where we're living in the environment of who the Lord Jesus is. You say, how do I live in the environment of the Lord Jesus? What well, can I tell you today? If you're saved, Jesus is in you. So if he's in you and you're in him, guess what? That means you're always in his presence and he's always in your presence. So can I tell you, that makes for a good environment. And so what is he saying? He says rejoice in the reality of the environment in which you have, the possession that you have in the Lord. Rejoice in the understanding and the knowledge that you are always consciously in the presence of a holy Lord and a holy God. Rejoice in that. You know, it's, it's amazing. Paul repeats this phrase so many times through the book of Philippians. And you say, why does he have to keep encouraging Christians to rejoice? Well, listen, folks, look, look at some of your faces sometimes. <laughs> Amen? And you'll understand very simply. And you say, what do you mean by that? I don't understand that. Well, listen to me. If you're saved today, you have a lot to rejoice in. But even if your circumstances are haywire, can I tell you, if you're saved today, you have a person to rejoice in. See, we always look at things we can rejoice in. But listen, folks, Christian life is not about things we rejoice in. And I'm glad I have things that come by Christ. I'm glad I have victory. I'm glad I have peace. I'm glad I have joy. I'm glad I have all those things. But listen, the reason to rejoice is not the things, but the reason to rejoice is the person. And if we have the person, we have everything we need. For he's enough. And so can I tell you today, if I understand and I'm conscious of the presence of the Lord within me, I have all I need to rejoice. That's the reason the Bible says that he is the joy. He, it's the joy of the Lord. My joy, he told the disciples, I give unto you. It's not just a feeling. It's something that is a fact of a person. It's a characteristic of a person that begins to ooze out of our lives as we begin to dwell in his presence and are conscious of his presence. You've heard me say this before. Let me say it again. A.W. Tozer said this many years ago. He said there'll never ever be a true revival in America until there's first a revival of the conscious presence of a holy God. We've lost the awe of his presence. And Paul's telling the church of Philippi, he says rejoice in the sphere of, in the environment of the Lord, conscious of his presence. And then he says this to him. He says, listen, he said, you may think this is cumbersome me to write this to you, but it's not. To you, it's safe. And then he gives them this part, the dangers of the Christian life. He says, listen, Church of Philippi, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision. Well, what is he talking about here? I mean, why is he telling them to be careful of dogs? Well, I promise you he's not talking about pet Fido. He's literally characterizing here the, these uh, the, that are called the Judaizers of that day who were infiltrating the churches and trying to convince the church that, that salvation was not just by grace, but it was by grace and by works. In other words, it was more than just say, coming to the place of the conviction of the Holy Spirit and yielding yourself and surrendering yourself to the Lord. What these Judaizers was telling them, listen, to truly be saved, it takes grace, but you ought to go, also got to be circumcised like a Jew. You also got to keep the law like a Jew. And Paul's coming along and he's saying to these of the church of Philippi, he said, beware, beware. Listen, folks, now y'all going to love me say amen. There's a lot of people under the skies or the disguise of the name of Jesus Christ that are trying to teach people that salvation is either so much more than the Bible says or so much less than the Bible says. I got news for you. Salvation is exactly what the Bible says. We don't have to water it down for this culture. And folks, we don't have to dress it up for this culture. Can I tell you, this word is just fine the way it is. 
But we're trying to change and manipulate it to make it fit in this generation. It's amazing to me. It's a different side of, a, of the same coin, but it, but it is the same coin. In that day, it was Judaism or Gnosticism. In this day, it's what we call contemporary. And we're trying to contemporary things. We're trying to make everything user-friendly for everybody. Can I tell you today, folks? Y'all love me, say amen. Whether it's works on one side or works on the other, it still works. And folks, listen. If it takes works to get somebody, it's going to take more works to keep them. But aren't you glad today we're not saved by grace but by works? Now, what Paul does here in verse 2 is he, he, he does a play on words. I, I love how he does this. The word dogs here literally speaks of predators. It, it speaks of, of, in that day, dogs were different than they are now. They were not pets. They were predators. And, and they fed mostly off of garbage and garbage dumps. I mean, they were scavengers, if you will. A, a common way that we would understand it in today's language, in that day, a dog would be considered what we consider a rat. And, and that's the way they would consider it. And here's the way he, he classifies these Judaizers. Now, you say this is amazing for Paul. Yes, why? Because he was one at one time. And he calls them scavengers. He says, and listen, they're saying that you must come by grace and your good works according to law. He says, but beware of evil workers. Again, a play on words. And then he says this. He says, beware of concision. What is that word? Well, it's a play on a word for circumcision. Circumcision was a religious, sanctified work in which God ordained in the Old Testament. But yet in the New Testament, the Bible says we're not circumcised by the flesh. We are circumcised in the heart. God removed our old heart and gave us a new heart, and we are now the circumcision of Christ. But yet the Jews were saying you have to have the physical act of circumcision. And so what he uses is a term concision here, which simply means fleshly mutilation. And he says, listen, he said, don't give yourself to these that say you must be circumcised. It's nothing more, nothing less than mutilation. He said, I'm telling you right now, look at the next verse, verse 3, for we are the circumcision. He said, this is who we are. Who's he tell, telling this to? Paul himself is saying of himself and who he's writing to, the church of Philippi. He said, listen, we are the circumcision. We don't have to go through a fleshly act of circumcision for God's done a spiritual act of circumcision in our hearts. And he says, we are. We are a walking testimony of what God intended in that Old Testament symbol. And, and Paul says this. This is the design of the Christian life. Now listen. Listen. He says, which worship God in spirit. Now, here's where the contrast begins. How can you tell what is genuine work of the Spirit of God and what is a false work of the Spirit of God? Now, now y'all going to love me? A genuine work of the Spirit of God is always initiated from the Spirit of God. A false work of the Spirit of God is something in which you have to encourage pump up, or exhort someone to bring. In other words, let me put it this way. If I've got to beg somebody to praise the Lord, it wasn't spirit work. I had a man come to me one time. Actually, I was sitting beside of him in a plane flying to do a pastor's retreat in Montana. And this was one of the pastors that was going to the retreat that I was going to do. And he was sitting across the aisle from me on the plane, and he said, he said to me, he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing good. What's your name? He told me. And I said, what church you pastor? And he told me. And I said, well, neat. I've not heard of that church. Tell me a little bit about it. He said, I want to tell you, it's a great church. I said, great. I said, what did God do Sunday? He said, well, I want to tell you something. He said, we pumped him up and we cheered him on. And by the time I got ready to preach, everybody was, was, was cheering God on. I looked at him and I said, excuse me? He said, what do you mean? I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you know what I mean. He said, we got them in an environment. They got all excited. And by the time I got up to preach, they were so emotionally excited. He said, it just carried on. I looked at him and I said, brother, you don't know me, do you? He said, no. 
I said, you ever thought that if the Spirit of God is doing the work, that you don't have to pump people up? And have you ever thought if the Spirit of God's doing the work, that Jesus don't need cheered on? Last time I, last time I read the Bible, Jesus is more than motivated himself. Amen? He don't need our help. But can I tell you, when the Spirit of God is at work, and when we worship in spirit, can I tell you, praise will be a natural response. Can I tell you, testimony will be a natural response. Can I tell you, singing will be a natural response. And what is Paul doing here? He said, listen, we are the circumcision. It's not by flesh. It's not by man-centered ways of doing things. It's not by the works of religion. He said it's by the work of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God circumcised our heart. The Spirit of God gave us a new heart. And he said worship is in the Spirit, not in the flesh. And then notice what he says. And rejoice in Christ Jesus, says it again. Now watch the end of this. And have no confidence, what? In the flesh. Isn't that amazing? What did he mean by this? What's the design of the Christian life? What Paul meant by this is simply this. Evaluate yourself absent of Christ. And when you do, you find out you're bankrupt. And then evaluate yourself in the person of Christ. And you, feel, and you find out you're spiritually rich. So guess what? In myself, I have no confidence. But in him, he can do all things through Christ. It strengthens me. So what he says is the design of the Christian life is to bow yourself out and to bow him in and everything. Have no confidence in the flesh. Now, well, all that was the introduction. Let's, let's look at the message now. I want you to look at the past deception of Paul. Because here's where Paul gets really personal. And, and I love what he does here. He, he says this, have no confidence in the flesh. And then he reverts back to the personal testimony of his own life. And notice what he says. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul going back to when he was lost, when he did not know Christ, when he had not encountered Christ on that road to Damascus. And he said, listen, if there was anybody that ever walked the face of this earth that could have said, I had confidence in my flesh, I'm the one you could have looked at and said, I'm the one. I'm the one. What is he speaking of? Well, verse 4 tells us that in this day and age of Paul before his conversion, that he had a deceptive reasoning. What was his reasoning? His reasoning was based upon the yardstick being man and not the Lord. Because listen, it's easy for us to measure ourselves against others. How many of you agree today that if we look hard enough, we're always going to find somebody that's worse off than we are? We're always going to find somebody a little sinful, more sinful than we think we are. We're always going to find somebody that, that, that claims to be spiritual but has skeletons in their closet, if you will, and always makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves. See, we can always do that. But here's the problem with that. To do that means that your reasoning is deceiving you because you're using the wrong measuring stick. Can I tell you today, what happened to Paul here? was when he encountered the person of Christ, all his measuring sticks went away, and he only had one left to look at. And when he saw Christ, he found out that his reasoning was deceptive at best. Isn't that amazing? See, we, we try to measure our spiritual life with so many other things. We, we try to measure it with other people. We try to measure it with... Sometimes our moms and our dads and our grandparents and, and different things like that, we try to measure it with maybe individuals in our life that were mentors in our life maybe. And we try to measure our spiritual life by those things. But listen to me, folks. The only one that matters and the only one we will be judged against is one person. 
and his name is Jesus Christ. That's it. And, and Paul said, I, I had a deceptive reasoning. He said, if any man thought he could trust in the flesh, I was the one. I was that example. If there was ever a man that could trust in the flesh. And then he, then he goes into describing his deceptive reputation. He said, not only could I trust the flesh, but he said, listen to, my, listen to my resume. Listen to my criteria here. He said, circumcise the eighth day. Well, what is that important? Well, in the Jewish law of that day, only one that was a true born Jew, born of a Jewish family, could be circumcised the eighth day. One that was grafted in from outside or a stranger that was grafted in had to wait till the 13th year to be circumcised. And he said, so I was born of the stock of Israel. He said, I, listen, I wasn't a stranger that came into Israel. He said, I was born into that blood. He, he says that. He said, the stock of Israel being, I was of the nation, the name of Israel. And, and you have to understand, for an Israelite of, of, of that day, to say they were of Israel was a great, great way to view themselves. I had a I was going to uh, Israel. I may have told you this story. If I did, pardon me. But I was going to Israel one time, and as I was flying from Newark, New Jersey to Tel Aviv, there was a whole bunch of Orthodox Jews on the plane. And one of my friends, a pastor friend of mine, got up to go to the restroom, and he bumped into this lady. She was an Orthodox Jewish lady. And when he bumped into her, she said, pardon me, I'm one of God's children. And if she'd have bumped into anybody else but Tommy, it'd have been okay. <laughs> Tommy looked at her and said, well, pardon me, I'm one of God's sons. Yeah. In other words, it was a source of pride to say they were of Israel. They were of Israel's stock. They were of God's people. It was a source of much pride for them. And he said, listen, he said, not only was I born into this, but I was of the stock of Israel and of the tribe of Benjamin. In other words, listen, if there was any tribe that you could be from, Benjamin was it. It was known in, in, in Israel's terminology as the purest bloodline of all the tribes. And so Paul said, listen, this is who I was. I, I, was, I was born into this glorious people, the apple of God's eyes, the stock of Israel. I called myself a child of God by Israel's rights. And he said, of not only that, but I was of the best of the 12 tribes. Well, I had a reputation. Y'all with me? Say amen. But notice he goes on. He said, not only that. He says, but I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now, why did he say it that way? Well, in this day in which Paul is speaking to the church of Philippi, there had become two sects of Jews. There had become the Orthodox and then what was called the Hellenistic Jews. And the Hellenistic Jews had gave into compromise and, and literally compromised their religion to feed into the Greek culture of that day. And here's what Paul's saying. He said, I'm not like those Hebrews that's caved into the culture of the Greeks, he said, I've, tr I've stood true to the orthodoxy of Judaism. He said, I'm not just a Hebrew, but I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I've stayed faithful. I've stayed in the religion in which I believe. And I've not flinched one bit. Isn't that amazing? And then he says, and touching the law, a Pharisee. You say, well, why was that important to Paul? Because, see, there was two groups of leaders in that day in Judaism, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, why was one different from the other? Because the Sadducees, like the Hellenistic Jews, had compromised, and in compromising, the Sadducees had gave themselves over to the culture of Rome, literally had become, if you will, uh, they had lined their pockets with the politicians of Rome. And Rome had used them in a mighty way to influence what the children of Israel did. But not the Pharisees. The Pharisees stayed faithful to the law and faithful to the truth. And here's what Paul says. He says, I wasn't a Sadducee, I was a Pharisee. Well, he had a reputation, didn't he? He said, concerning zeal... 
Notice his deceiving resolve. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous was all blameless. In other words, here's what Paul's saying. He said, my religion was so ingrated in me that it wasn't just what I said. I acted upon what I said. Listen, it's one thing to say truth. It's another thing to defend truth. And Paul said, I believe this with every fiber of my being to the point that I acted upon it. And when the church began to rise and say that Jesus was a Messiah, I said, heresy, heresy. And Paul said, I went out and persecuted them in great zeal and in great passion because of the religion that was ingrained within me. My resolve was deceiving. But he also had a deceptive righteousness. He says it's touching the law, righteous. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher, what did he mean by that? Surely he didn't think that he was righteous before God. Oh, he did. Matter of fact, all you had to do was ask him, he'd have told you. You say, how could he believe that? Well, let's get a little bit of a mindset of of a Jew of that day. Okay, y'all with me? Say amen. All right, here's here's how a Jewish person believed in that day. They believe that God ordained the fast. How many agree that God ordained the fast? Y'all can raise your hand. It's not a trick question. How many agree God ordained the fast? Well, let me tell you what they believed about it, and let's compare it to what we believe about it. They believed that when you fasted, not only could you not eat or drink, but if you swallowed your own spittle, you sinned against the fast. When I was in Israel... In 99 and 2000, we stayed in Jerusalem on what their Sabbath day was. And in that day, when we were there, the, the elevators stopped at every floor going up and every floor going down. Every floor, the door would open and close, open and close. I went down. I said, something's wrong with the elevator. He said, no, it's a Sabbath. I said, so? He said, listen. He said, for them to hit a button is considered work, and they don't work on the Sabbath. How are we doing, Christians? <laughs> Y'all with me? Say amen. You see, he's saying, listen, as far as the law is concerned, as far as I saw myself in light of the law, he said, I was keeping it, and therefore I was righteous before God. Deceived. You say, were well, there are other people like this in Scripture? Oh, yes. Mark chapter 10 gives us a great example of a rich man that came to the Lord Jesus. Y'all remember him? He came and ran at the Lord Jesus, fell at his feet, and said, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the law. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not kill. He said, oh, Jesus, I've kept those steps by you. Deceive. Deceive. You say, preacher, I don't understand. Why is Paul telling them this? And more importantly, why are you telling us this? It's not circumcision. It's not swallowing your spittle when you fast. It's not uh, praying three times a day. By the way, Christians, I'll throw this one out for free. Y'all, y'all going to love me? Say amen. We believe a tithe is 10%. Amen? Well, guess what did you believe the tithe was? 33 and a third percent. How we do it? And you say, preacher, what are you doing? I say, I'm just trying to show you something. That just as Paul was religious and deceived, there's people today that can be religious and deceived. Because a lot of people think that if I, you know, listen, if I throw out my token attendance on Sunday, and if I throw out this, and I throw out this, and I do this, and I do this, and if I try to do my best to do this, and I try to do my best to do this, then God will understand what I'm trying to do. And God will understand, and God will not cast me away. That's what Paul thought. But notice what Paul said. Notice the present deliverance of Paul. I love verse 7. He says, but what things were gained to me those I counted lost for Christ. I mean, I don't know about you, but this is an amazing passage to me. Now, you have to put yourself in Paul's mindset. 
Remember, folks that are taking how to study the Bible, one of the things I've tried to teach you is get yourself in the mindset of the one writing it. Find out who's writing it so you can understand what they're saying. Remember, Paul, when he was in this condition, was fully convinced to the point that he was persecuting and stoning Christians that he was right. And every time he picked up a stone and threw it at a Christian, he believed he was honoring God and doing it. But yet something happened in Paul's life to cause him to look at all of that heritage and all of that reputation and all of that religion and all of that self-righteousness and all of a sudden look at it a whole different way. What was it? He encountered a person. His name was Jesus. Acts chapter 9. Paul was on the road to Damascus. His name was Saul at that time. And as Saul was on the road to Damascus, he came in the presence of the incarnate Son of God. Only time Jesus Christ has shown himself visibly of since the, the, the ascension into heaven in Acts chapter 1, and the only time since, and he will not show himself again visibly, folks, until he comes back for his church. You say, why did he show himself to Paul? Because Paul was going to be the 12th apostle. And the apostles were called personally by the Lord Jesus. Every one of them. Now y'all listen to me. So these guys out here calling themselves apostles, run! Run! You say, well preacher, maybe there's more than 12. No, the Bible says there's 12 foundations in the new heaven and new earth. And the 12 foundations have the 12 names of the 12 apostles. That's pretty clear to me. church is one with Christ. So what the world does to us is do it to the soul. Why persecute us thou me? Because see, Paul's sin wasn't just against the church. Paul's sin was first against God. And so the Lord identified him where he was. He said, why persecute us thou me? The Bible says that Paul, literally struck by the, the presence of God, left that place blind for three days, did not eat or did not drink for three days. Ananias came, and the Lord spoke to Ananias in a vision and said, listen, go down to Damascus. I think you'll find a young man down there. Interesting little lot. He, he was one that thought he was persecuting the church and pleasing God. I think I got his attention. By the way, you'll find him down there praying. Paul, in all his confidence, in all his fleshly confidence, thinking he was right before God just a few seconds before he encountered Christ, believing if he died today, not only would he go to heaven, but he'd probably have a throne at the right hand of God, deceived in every bit of his religion, encounters Christ, and now all of a sudden, here's a man that had religion and left with a relationship. Had confidence in his flesh. And left dead to his flesh. Had confidence in his religion. And now considered it to be garbage. Isn't that amazing? You tell me Jesus don't make a difference. Paul says I, I, I encountered Christ. And when I encountered him. He said but all things were gained to me. All those things that I thought in my lostness was precious to me. Precious to me as a Jew. He said, I now see as a loss. Why? That I may count it loss for Christ. That I may gain Christ. Oh, listen, folks. Paul's evaluation of his own life. The word count there means to evaluate. Now, I, I want to do this, and then I'm going to finish this up. Now, I want you to hear me. I, I believe salvation costs something. As a matter of fact, Luke 14 says it this way. He says, unless a man take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. And then he says, what man delivers a building that does not count the cost? Go with me. You 
say, well, wait a minute, preacher, I thought you said salvation is not a works. I didn't say it was by works. I'm saying once you give in to the grace of God, it'll cost something. It's not the way you get in, it's the result of after you get in. And, and here's, what, here's what Paul said. Paul said, literally, I turned from everything I thought I was, and I turned from everything that I thought I had, and I turned away from it, counted it as lost, that I may gain him. So let me ask you a question. What did you think you lost when you got saved? You say, well, preacher, I didn't lose anything when I got saved. Preacher, I didn't have to give up anything when I got saved. Y'all love me? You better make sure you got it then. Because let me tell you what Paul lost. He lost his Jewish reputation. He lost his influence. Say, what do you mean? Pharisee was considered one of the hierarchies of the people. When you walked down the street and you came near a Pharisee, you literally moved out of the way because here come one greatly more spiritual than you were and you moved out of their way. I mean, popular, prominent, wealthy. Here's a man that went from being in all the popularity and pomp of a Pharisee to building tents to make a living. Now, preacher, are you saying I have to give up everything I have? No, it's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying this. In your mind and in your heart, you ought to be willing to. Y'all with me? Say amen. Amen. This is, this is what it is. This is Christianity. And Paul says, I've counted all this loss that I've been in Christ. Now, watch this with me. Notice what Paul now considers that. In verse 8, yea, doubtless, I count all things for loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. And notice the words here, my Lord. Remember before, Paul was his own Lord. His flesh, it, the law, was what governed him. But now Paul says, I look at it different. Now I see, I see things totally different. I see the excellency that's in knowing Christ. In knowing Christ. He said this becomes my new excellency in my life. For whom I have offered the loss of all things. And do count them but dung, being garbage. That I may win Christ. The word win there is really not a great word here. The, the real word means gain Christ. Because listen. It's not, a, it's not a contest in which if you fight hard enough you may win something here. No, this is something in which you give yourself and you yield yourself and surrender and you will gain this. He gained Christ by counting all things lost. Let me give you an illustration. Maybe this will help you. I, I, I can see some of you looking at me like a new calf staring in a new gate. <laughs> Listen to me. Hudson Taylor. Y'all ever heard of Hudson Taylor? Missionary? Hudson Taylor was known as a man of faith. Hudson Taylor literally had abandoned, in, in our eye, our estimation of things, our physical eyes, he had abandoned everything to go to China on missions. Hudson Taylor was asked one day by a man who knew him very well. And he says, Brother Taylor, he said, it's obvious you have sacrificed everything for Christ. Hudson Taylor looked at this man. He said, oh, no, sir. No, sir. He said, I've never sacrificed anything. He says, I've gained everything. The man looked at Hudson Taylor and said, I don't understand. What do you mean? He said, all that you gave up. He said, no, no, no. I didn't give up anything. Christ made the sacrifice. All I'm doing is gaining what he sacrificed for me. In other words, what Hudson Taylor was saying, that everything he could have had in a comfortable life in America was not to him a sacrifice. To him it was a gain to be in the center of God's will. See, that's the mindset. You say, well, that's not what Paul's saying. It's exactly what Paul's saying. Notice what he says here in the bottom of verse 8. He said, I have suffered the law of all things and do count them dung that I may gain Christ. 
Let me ask you a question. If you had garbage as your possession and you lost it, would you be heartbroken? Would you consider that a great loss? What about if your greatest possessions was taken from you? Would you consider that a loss? See, here's the mindset of Paul. He said, I, I, can't, I gave up everything in my estimation of how I saw it as a Jew. But now in the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, he said, I see it all different. He said, even though I thought all this was great, he said it was garbage. And he said, now I see what is great. And he said, so I didn't lose anything. I gained a lot. And here's the end of it. Notice the experience of Paul. Verse 9. And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now I want you to see this word in here. Y'all see that last phrase, which is of God by faith? Y'all see that? Say amen. The word of there is a little preposition. It means out of. It literally reads this way in the original Greek. It reads this way. Faith in the righteousness that comes out of God by faith. Literally what Paul said, I begin to experience in my life something so glorious. He said, I found out that I didn't have no righteousness even though I thought I was walking in righteousness. And he said, then when I found out I didn't have any righteousness, he said, then I began to experience that I had a great righteousness, but it wasn't mine. It was a righteousness that came out of God through Christ into me, imputed and imparted unto me. And he said, I found out I had a righteousness so much better than what I thought I had, so much better than what I could ever account I had. And listen, I found out my old righteousness was filled the rest, but his righteousness is glory and pure. He said, oh, I didn't lose anything. I just gained it. I gain. You say, well, preacher, can you apply this to my life? Well, let me do it this way. I'll use the words of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus said it this way. Except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes of the Pharisees, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we talked just a little bit about what it meant to be righteous in a Pharisee's mindset. And so here's what, Paul, here's what Jesus said. Unless your righteousness exceed that. Why did Jesus say that? Because the Pharisee thought that they were living at the pinnacle of righteousness. And Jesus said, you're nowhere close. And you say, well, what is a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees? One that thinks he's sinned if he swallows his spittle. One that thinks he's sinned if he doesn't go and pray in the temple three times a day. One that thinks he's sinned if he doesn't give 33 and a third percent of his income. One that thinks he's sinned that any moment of time, if he lifts one stick on the Sabbath day, that he could be killed of God. What kind of righteousness exceeds that? Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So guess what? You don't have to try harder. You just have to say yes. Don't that take a load off? You just have to say yes. But listen, to say yes also means you're saying no. You say, preacher, I don't understand. Wait a minute. You just told me all I got to do is say yes. Now you got to say, I'll tell you. That. Listen, you're never going to say yes to his righteousness if you first don't see how inadequate your righteousness is. So saying yes to him automatically is saying no to yourself. Now I'm going to close. Has that ever happened to you? Now listen to me. Listen to me. It doesn't matter about anything else but this. 
Has there ever been a time and a place in your life that you encountered the Lord Jesus in the conviction of the Holy Spirit? And through the Word of God, He convicted you and showed you how bankrupt, how helpless and hopeless you were. And He didn't ask you to join a church. And he didn't ask you to be a Sunday school teacher. He didn't ask you to take the office of a deacon. He didn't ask you to fulfill the call of a pastor. He didn't ask you to give more. He didn't ask you to attend more. He didn't ask you to do any of those things to rectify your condition of helpless and hopeless. All he asked you to do was one thing. Say yes to who you are and yes to who he is. That's it. Has that ever happened to you? See, there's this doctrine going around today. The salvation is just intellectually confessing that Jesus Christ is. But folks, you can intellectually confess Jesus Christ is and never possess Jesus Christ's life. Salvation is not committing yourself to him. Salvation is surrendering yourself to him. Committing is works. Surrender is faith. If Donald walked up to me with a gun, can I tell you what I'd do? It would be a natural impulse. If Donald walked up to me in the back with a gun and I heard that hammer pull, I wouldn't even have to think about it. You know what I'd do? <laughs> Y'all agree with me? How many agree? You wouldn't have to sit there. Well, let me see what I'm going to do in this situation. How many agree? Why? Because you're going to yield to the one that's in control. Now, if Donner walk up to me with a gun and say, all right, I'm going to commit myself to do something about this. How many of you agree? I'm not saying Donald's in control. See, salvation's not committed. Salvation's surrendering. And so when you come to, your, to the place like Paul did and you say, I am absolutely bankrupt, I'm hopeless and I'm helpless, let me ask you a question. If you see yourself that way, what do you got to commit to? So what's the only alternative? I wish I had a hanky. You know why? Because salvation is where you raise the white flag and you say, I surrender. Has that ever happened? Or was your church membership your commitment? Or was your surrender your salvation? Think about it. You say, that don't make sense. Well, that's what happened with Paul. And if it happened to Paul, how many agree it could happen to us? Father, I love you and I praise you and I thank you. Lord, I, I just want to thank you today that, Lord, you know each and every one of our hearts here today. Lord, you know my heart. You know each of our hearts. And Lord, you know that, Lord, there's those in this world that, Lord, are living under the disguise of religious performance. And Lord, you know there are those in this world that have truly surrendered themselves unto you in grace and in faith. And Father, they've come to the place, maybe in even childlike terms, They've come to the place of acknowledging that they can't do anything but your Lord, your life, and your everything. And Lord, their life has proved out their faith. For faith without works is dead. And their life has proved out that they're 
heart is yielded and surrendered to you. It's not that they're perfect. It's not that any of us are perfect. But Father, the preponderance of their life bears testimony that You are Lord and You are life. But Father, I pray today if there's anybody in this place that Father, maybe, maybe through just never being taught, maybe through not understanding, maybe through just willingly not being willing to deal with who they really are. Lord, they tried to substitute this step of surrender and repentance. They tried to substitute it with something that was far easier. It was far easier to put my name on a church roll. It's far easier to just repeat what the pastor said to repeat. It's far easier to just get my clothes wet in a baptistry. But Lord, in reality, they've never been changed. They've never been transformed. Lord, you know our hearts. And Lord, you know if there's anybody in here in that state, in that condition. Lord, let us learn from Paul. Why did Paul give this message to a church of believers? He was trying to help them not to be deceived. He was trying to help them to not listen to the teaching that those Judaizers were trying to teach them. He was trying to give them a firm foundation of faith. And Lord, that's the reason it's important to us. That's the reason we need to hear this. So Father, have Your will and Your way for Your glory. In Jesus' name.